and so I'm a pediatric endocrinologist in Denver, Colorado in the United States, and I'm very happy to be uh, able to have a chance to talk to you today at Diacon 2021. I had an opportunity to be there a few years ago, and um, I'm, I'm sorry that we can't be together in person, but a uh, very warm uh, greetings to my friends and my colleagues in Ahmedabad, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for do uh, to Dr. Sabu and the um, uh, planning committee for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I am going to move a little bit quickly today through my slides. I have no conflicts of interest and just with 20 minutes to talk about current trends in type 1 diabetes in children, I'm going to uh, talk about really these three areas here, staging of type 1 diabetes and the potential to improve long-term outcomes. Uh, we'll talk about COVID-19 because of course we have to living in the middle of a pandemic and uh, really what the limits are with the data in children with type 1 diabetes. And we'll talk a little bit about diabetes technology um, and how that's improving outcomes and has the potential to uh, in, uh, improve outcomes even beyond. So let's start a little bit with the new staging paradigm for type 1 diabetes. Um, this is um, you know, the traditional criteria for diagnosis of type, type 1 diabetes has been glucocentric. So elevated A1C or elevated glucose, fasting, glucose tolerance test, or random plasma samples. Uh, but really what this is, is this is the tip of the iceberg. You know, we have symptomatic diabetes, which is how we've always defined diabetes, but there is a progressive beta cell loss that is ongoing long before the symptoms appear. So there's, there's this, we, we think of this maybe like a tip of the iceberg. There's a lot that's going on before the diagnosis and even after the diagnosis, we should consider. Um, and the traditional pathway to diagnosis of type 1 diabetes has always been, you know, some genetic predisposition that encounters some environmental trigger or maybe some triggers that leads to beta cell injury. And then we see loss of um, beta cells along with the islet antibodies being positive in the blood. And then of course that leads to progressive loss of insulin. Um, and then we reach this clinical onset. And that's been always where we define type one diabetes and the onset of diabetes. Um, but we really could look back to these, the, the, the islet autoantibodies as an earlier marker in a time that we might have an opportunity to intervene. So this is a paper courtesy of uh, one of my colleagues at the Barbara Davis Center, um, was published a few years ago, looking at disc glycemia six months before diagnosis in a child who was in a screening study. And you can see around the morning hours, we had pre preserved glycemia, but during later in the afternoon and the evening, there was more variability, more hyperglycemia. And two months before diagnosis, you can see that the blood sugar trends get a little bit worse. Yet again, more time above range. And then at the time of diabetes diagnosis, when this child was symptomatic, uh, this child had failed an oral glucose tolerance test. But interestingly, A1C was still preserved. So we're still very early on in the disc glycemia, but this was the time to start insulin. And we had seen this coming and unfortunately we can't stop this progression. Uh, but the new paradigm is to think about a pre-symptomatic diabetes, so stage one being the, uh, the, the encountering of two or more autoantibodies positive. That would be here, where we still have normal glucose at this stage. Then when we move on to an impaired uh, fasting glucose or uh, impaired glucose tolerance, so we're starting to see some abnormal blood sugars in association with the autoantibodies. That's stage two. And then stage two, at stage three, two moves on to stage three, which is the clinical diagnosis that we've thought about in the past. So standard diabetes criteria. But we should call this now stage three to diabetes, whereas stage one and stage two actually deserve a categorization. They deserve a name. Um, and we should track these patients when we see them in clinic. Why is this important? Um, and I don't have time to show a lot of the slides, but if we screen people for diabetes, and we have a lot of screening studies that have been done over the years, we prevent ketoacidosis in those patients. And why is it important to prevent ketoacidosis at the onset or at the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes? Long-term trajectory, so long-term A1C, at least nine years out, and you could presume probably beyond that even, um, it is, is poorer in those who've had ketoacidosis at the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. So we can set our patients up from the beginning to do better. Now, there, there could be possibly a different phenotype um, between uh, those who have DKA and those who don't. So those with DKA, maybe they lost beta cells more quickly, but there's enough research that's been shown that if we intervene early on with patients, we do reduce the risk of DKA. And so we really think that there might be a, a different phenotype for some patients who progress more quickly, but it's also, it's also uh, the, the opinion of the experts that we're gonna prevent long-term poor glycemia. And so we can do a lot for our patients, not just now, but this builds the case for population screening for type 1 diabetes. And, and, and that case is the case of cost effectiveness that we're trying to build. Uh, we are getting to the point where we do have some medications that 
have been shown in trials to reduce uh, or, or to, to lengthen the time between identification of autoantibodies to the onset of needing insulin. So teplizumab is one of those medications been shown in a stage three trial uh, that was published a couple of years ago. It's not approved by the FDA in the United States. I don't think it's being clinically used anywhere in the United States or any, anywhere in the world. But there is the potential with uh, technologies like these monoclonal antibodies that if we screen for patients, if we identify the patients who will likely go on to develop type 1 diabetes, that we could delay the onset of clinical diagnosis of diabetes. So I'm going to move on to this slide here. Uh, we'll talk about COVID-19 and type 1 diabetes. Um, there's been a lot of uh, things published in the last year. Of course, you know, we don't have time to, to survey all of them. I think one of the best studies to look at, now I'm a pediatrician, and this study really looks first at adults with diabetes. And you can see over here on the graph on the right, uh, we knew from the early data coming out of China early in 2020 that diabetes was a risk factor for poor outcomes um, it, with COVID-19. And those with type 1 diabetes in this, in this very interesting UK study, it was a whole population study, over 61 million patients have their data in the national database. Those with type 1 had increased risk of death above the general population, above those with not, without diabetes, those are the bottom two lines here, but also even higher than those with type 2 diabetes. Certainly, um, those error bars do not cross one another in the over 70 groups. Uh, and then you can see there's probably even that dose, uh, probably that uh, diabetes type effect, even if we, as we get to the 60s and to the 50s. But fortunately for those below age 50, the risk of death was so low among those with type 1 diabetes that it would have been a privacy violation for them to even publish any numbers. So that's encouraging for those below 50. Why is the risk worse with type 1 who are over age 50? It's probably the fact that there's a longer diabetes duration for those with type 1 compared to the peers of the same age with type 2, even though those with type 2 have higher risk of obesity and hypertension and hyperlipidemia. It's probably a diabetes duration effect. Unfortunately, these authors didn't have access to diabetes duration. Otherwise, that would have been a very interesting factor to factor into this, uh, to this data set. Uh, there have been a few papers published on children with type 1 diabetes. This comes from the United States um, in this health system. You'll notice the authors here did a really nice uh, case control study, uh, but th there are no pediatricians that are involved in this study. And, and this, these data were from their, their initial study. They also published a, a follow-up with a larger number of patients here. But from their initial study, they, they, they paint this really nice, pretty green regression line showing the, the probability of hospitalization in those 18 and below. In the initial data set, it was just eight patients and the expanded data set, just 22. And it gives me pause to think about this regression line from the adult years being extended all the way to the pediatric years. And especially in light of what we saw from the Holman paper that I just saw. So it is possible that patients with type one diabetes have increased risk of hospitalization when they get COVID-19 above people without diabetes. But does that risk of hospitalization, is that higher than it would have been without diabetes or without COVID, um, I should say. Uh, but it, I also have a little bit of pause about using these data extrapolated into the pediatric age range. So I don't think we can really extrapolate much here. I think for adults, yes, but for children, um, I don't really like to see this line extended down this far. Uh, there was a nice paper also from the United States, a large health system with um, I think it was 37 million, or I'm sorry, 3.7 million um, records looking at claims data. Type 1 diabetes, among all the chronic pediatric medical conditions, type 1 diabetes was associated with the highest risk of hospitalization. Unfortunately, despite how robust these data were during 2020, they did not compare these data to pre-pandemic data. And that's what I really would have liked to have seen here. Of course, that would be a different, a different study, and that's why they didn't publish that yet. Hopefully these authors or somebody else will look at it that way and not, not will say, they won't say type one diabetes is associated with high risk of hospitalization, but with COVID-19, do these patients have increased risk of hospitalization than they did before COVID-19? We know people with type one diabetes experience ketoacidosis or severe hypoglycemia, but is this a higher risk with COVID? I can't extract that from this paper. Here And so, again, looks very convincing that it's a higher risk of hospitalization, but it, I have difficulty drawing that same conclusion um, that, that some would have if they look at this, if they look just at this figure. 
So the T1D exchange, you may be familiar with their work. This is also US based. There's 56 centers across the United States who participated in this COVID-19 surveillance, surveillance registry. We published about six papers. I think it was six papers we published and the number of um, posters and abstracts we've done as well. Uh, most recently, we just had uh, this last paper that I'll show some data for accepted to JCEM, JCEM. Um, and we, there's also a pediatric patient with 266 patient, uh, a pediatric paper, 266 patients that are in that paper. Um, the most common adverse event among adults and children was diabetic ketoacidosis, roughly 70% of the uh, adverse events that were experienced. In the pediatric paper specifically, 266 cases, four patients needed respiratory support. When I reviewed um, all those data that were available for that paper, as well as all the charts that, of patients that we had submitted from our center, most of those patients who were hospitalized, COVID-19 was incidental. And what I mean by that is they did not need respiratory support. They did not have documented loss of taste or smell. They didn't have cough. They didn't have nasal congestion. COVID-19 testing was positive upon admission. Um, and these patients weren't febrile. I don't think any of those patients uh, from our center were febrile. So again, it raises the question is, did COVID-19 put them in the hospital or were they going to have diabetic ketoacidosis uh, with or without COVID-19 and they just had omitted their insulin? Um, and then you can see in this, these logistic regression analyses, over age 40 was a very strong risk factor but for, for hospitalization and adverse outcomes. But the 19 to 40 year old group had, if anything, trended towards lower risk for hospitalization. They, it wasn't statistically significantly different from the reference group, uh, but certainly not a higher risk among that group. What were the risk factors beyond age? A1C, and we know A1C, higher A1C is a risk factor for higher risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. This was not a surprise. Unfortunately, also in the United States, our racial and ethnic minority patients, especially those non-Hispanic black patients, have poorer outcomes across all health conditions. So unfortunately, it was not a surprise that ethnic and minority race and ethnicity um, was a very strong risk factor for adverse outcomes uh, in this US data set. Other comorbidities, uh, especially um, heart disease, underlying heart disease and kidney disease were, were risk factors for hospitalization. But aside from age and increased A1C, was COVID-19 a cause of putting them in the hospital or did they just have DK because they admitted insulin and they happened to have COVID-19? We could not really extract that from these data here. So overall, I have measured reassurance for my pediatric patients, uh, but COVID-19 is definitely a terrible disease. When my patients are eligible for a vaccine, I advise them all to be vaccinated. I advise them to socially distance, to wear a mask um, and avoid uh, being exposed to this disease. But I do not think that there's strong evidence that they have increased risk for severe disease beyond what their peers may experience, those without diabetes. So we'll talk a little bit about newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes and COVID-19. Um, the Germans, you know, they do really good registries. Uh, the DPV registry has been around for over 20 years. They published this paper early in 2020, uh, looking at a, a window in the spring of 2020. And the number of new onset patients who were newly diagnosed during this window fell right in line with what was expected. Um, in several follow-up papers from around the world, anybody who has large numbers of patients to evaluate have said, we do not see an increased number of patients um, coming to our clinic with, with new onset or newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes. Um, and it'll be really interesting to follow this in the long run, uh, but at least the early data indicates that we, or suggests that we don't have a, a spike in the incidence of type 1 diabetes. This was an early question um, that came out knowing the physiology of, of how uh, the COVID-19 virus uh, binds to uh, some, of the, some of the cells, especially the endocrine cells. Um, this paper was just published within the last few weeks in, the, in pediatrics. This is also from the same group with some of the same authors. And they looked at the rate of ketoacidosis and severe ketoacidosis in DPV during 2020. And you can see there was definitely a significant increase in ketoacidosis and, se and severe ketoacidosis in the spring months through the early fall. So April through September was statistically significantly different. Uh, so there was a spike in DKA. And why do we see a spike in DKA? Well, they saw it in Germany, it's been reported in Canada, it's been reported, this was a paper that we published earlier in 2021 from our group. 
Um, we care for a population of about 4,000 children and adolescents with type 1 diabetes. We, we uh, have a very large catchment area. And we saw spikes in DKA, just like the Germans saw during the lockdown period and immediately following that as society began to slowly reopen. And then our DKA rates um, came back towards the, the, the range that they had been in the previous three years. Uh, this is unacceptably high at baseline, but it's not increased from baseline. And um, fortunately, we, we weren't increased beyond that. So it's delayed care, patients not going into the to the doctor and being evaluated. And unfortunately, even though the United States is a very wealthy country, there are a lot of barriers to primary care, especially among patients who are middle and lower income. And that's uh, that's our hypothesis that we'll test further. Um, and, I, and I hope to see that uh, the borne out and we can advocate for better care for uh, patients in the U.S. and beyond. So let's end on a lighter note and we'll talk a little bit about uh, diabetes technology. So pumps, CGM, hybrid closed loop, and the promise that has to improve outcomes for patients who have access. So I already mentioned the T1D exchange. The research registry was uh, active for about 10 years. This paper was published in 2019 with data from, I think, 2016 to 2018. And you can see here that those who use insulin pump and CGM, that's the diagonal bars in each of these groups here to the far right, you can see pump and CGM used together is associated with the lowest A1C across several of these groups, about the same uh, as the CGM without pump in the, in the older patients, the over 26, but it's a pretty consistent trend. Those who use neither CGM nor pump have the highest A1C across the groups. But it's very interesting for us to note today in 2021, as we look at our data currently in the T1D exchange registry, these data predate factory calibrated CGM like the Freestyle Libre and Libre 2 and the Dexcom G6 and others that may be available in other countries. Um, and these, these, also, these data also predate any hybrid closed loop systems. They were not available um, in the US at this time when, when this was published. So what do we see currently? Well, we're really excited. These are not real world studies. These are the uh, pivotal studies from the Medtronic 670G, 780G, it's Tandem Control IQ. The, those products are available in the United States. Insulet's OP5 system is under FDA review. We hope to see it used clinically. I don't think it's available in any other countries yet. But between 5 to 15% increase in time and range across these groups. So a 10% increase in time and range is, about, is 144 minutes or nearly two and a half hours per day. And it would be associated with a decrease in A1C by about a half a percent. So these are patients who generally were doing pretty well with their diabetes management at baseline, and that's why they were recruited to studies. Uh, but we have recently published our data. We have presented this at um, an academic meeting here in the United States. We're going to be presenting at IS ISPAD. We have an e-poster that's been accepted, and we have a paper. I'm not going to show the, the data from the paper uh, because that's been in submission. But the data from that we had submitted this last spring with just 2,600 patients before we had evaluated more thoroughly we have very high pump and CGM use among our group, uh, and we reflect at least a national trend in the United States uh, and, and are leading the trends worldwide with rapidly increasing use of CGM, high use of insulin pump. And the reason I'm showing you these US data is because I'm very excited for what these technologies can do for patients. Those who use pump and CGM together, that's the diagonal, um, or the, the, the horizontal lines to the far right in each of these age groups here, you can see is significantly lower than the A1C across the other groups. And it's very interesting that CGM without pump, that's the white bars, have, have definitely a much lower A1C than those patients who use pump but no CGM. Uh, there was a recent uh, multi-center study done by the SWEET group um, uh, published this year as well that showed that pump users without CGM did have a lower A1C than their uh, counterparts who used MDI without CGM. Um, but we didn't see that trend, at least in our center in the US. So potentially pump use can lower, lead to lower A1C, but adding a CGM, if I had a choice between a pump and a CGM, I would choose a CGM 10 times out of 10 for my patients. And that's what I encourage my patients to use. Um, but when, if we were to compare these A1C trends to the previous graph, you would see that the difference between pump and CGM, uh, the pump CGM group to the reference group is larger than what the T1D exchange showed. And that's because we have about a third of our pump and CGM users using hybrid closed loop now. It accounts for about a three quarter point difference, which is greater than the difference than we would have expected to see based on the pivotal trial data if you were to pool that data. So it's very encouraging to me that real world data for hybrid closed loop looks better than the pivotal study data. And it's almost all the way, it's almost 
the, the other way around in all the other studies we see, we're in a very controlled study environment. The data look better than we actually see in real life. But this is a time where I think real world um, outcomes are actually going to be better for our patients. So in conclusions, touching on those areas again, as I wrap up, early identification of type 1 diabetes will lead to improved long-term health. It's unclear how much additional risk COVID-19 poses to children with type 1 diabetes compared to their peers with di without diabetes. Uh, the pandemic has certainly exposed how decreased healthcare access impacts children with diabetes, and diabetes technology certainly improves glycemia. This is my email address. Um, unfortunately, I won't be available to uh, to be a part of the discussion and uh, section uh, discussion Q and A session following this. Um, so if you do have any questions you'd like to message me, I'm happy to have a discussion. Um, and I'm also happy if uh, Dr. Sabu and the team uh, would like to share my slides with any of the participants. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to, to converse with you and, and let you have my slides. So thank you very much again for the opportunity to join Diacare 2021, and I hope you have a good rest of your conference.